think that's working. Um, so. Yeah, that's recording. Um, the session will be an hour, so we'll finish at 4 p.m. New Zealand time. Um, so do some maths, 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 1 p.m. Um, 1 p.m. We're starting. Um, so I'll just introduce myself. So hi everyone. My name is Emma Bodley. I work at the Auckland Botanic Gardens. I'm the Botanical Records and Conservation Specialist, and I am the chair of BCAM. Um, so thanks for joining our first plant forum of the year, and this is a special one because we are hosting this with the ANPC. So um, the next few plant forums will focus around um, some of the topics that came through the germplasm guidelines. So um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're from and what your role is. It's really nice to see um, a diverse group of people here. And I know this topic is relevant to so many different roles in botanic gardens, um, from nursery staff to record staff, um, field staff, scientists, all sorts. So we've got a really exciting lineup today. We've got uh, three speakers. So we've got Amelia Martin Jensen, who was the project um, coordinator for the ANPC germplasm guidelines. And we've also got Damien Wrigley um, and Damien. Uh, sorry, yes, so many notifications from everyone joining. Um, so Damien's the national coordinator of the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. And we've got two special people in the audience today. Um, in case you send us any curly questions, we've got Joel Cohen from uh, Royal Botanic Gardens, Sydney. He's the Senior Plant Mapping and Records Manager. And we've also got James Wood, the Manager of the Tasmanian Sea Conservation Centre at the Royal Tasmanian Botanic Gardens. So it's lovely to have everyone on board today. And I'm just gonna hand straight over to Amelia to get us started. Thanks so much, Emma. I'll get my presentation happening and lovely to see everyone here today. Um, from the beginning. And okay, how does that look, Emma? Good. Okay, fantastic. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on today, particularly the Darug and Darawal people who are custodians of the lands where I live and work, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank Emma for hosting and presenting in today's webinar, and the Germplasm Guidelines Steering Committee and ANPC are so grateful we have the opportunity to share some information from the Germplasm Guidelines. We hope it's helpful to people managing and working on conservation collections. I'd also like to thank Damien Wrigley, who's the National Coordinator of the Australian Seed Bank Partnership and a member of our steering committee for sharing information on the ALA Seed Portal today. So when I think about record keeping and data in plant collections, it's often the information that I can see when I visit a garden or a site, the kind of public facing information that comes to mind. Um, the common element is generally the species name, but it might also include the collection location, the distribution, the habitat, or notes about its use. Um, for this calistamine specimen you can see in the National Bonsai and Penjing collection, it includes information about tree age, the date at which, which bonsai shaping began, and who trained and donated the plant. When it comes to botanic garden collections, labels might include information for the public, as well as information relating to the plant records. So you can see there's two labels each for these um, attractor carpus and cyclamen specimens. Labels might be used to tell your colleagues what to do when looking after the collections, like this Liparia seedling grown at the Millennium Seed Bank from 200 year old seed. And it might include the reason why the plant is so special. As you can see in these labels from the Shoalhaven Heads Native Botanic Garden on the New South Wales South Coast. The Carimbia, the image at the top, is planted in memory of the founding member of the garden and the Brachychida specimen below has collection and germination dates from a small seed batch of a threatened species. 
one of the really interesting points about record keeping is that the person capturing the information might have different ideas about what's important compared to the end user of that information, which might be different again to the information that's interesting to the general public and displayed on these kind of labels. And plant labels themselves are critical, but record keeping and data management is a much broader subject that we'll delve into today. So I'm going to focus on record keeping in conservation collections with particular reference to the germplasm guidelines that were published last year. Excuse me. The most important thing to know is that conservation collections held off-site or ex situ have three components. These are the plants or plant tissues, collectively known as germplasm, and then a herbarium voucher specimen to verify the plant identity. And then finally, all the other kinds of data that go along with the collection. So field data, curation and testing data, and distribution data. And keeping good records is essential to maintaining the value of the conservation collection and making sure it can be used as planned. And often this is many years later. Records are also really important to demonstrate that germplasm has been lawfully collected and the licenses, um, the license conditions may specify particular information that needs to be captured and shared relating to that collection. So I'll start first with botanical voucher specimens and then go on to different kinds of germplasm. Botanical specimens are taken to vouch for the identity of a seed or a cutting collection. And it means that future taxonomic changes can be aligned with that collection. So everything's matched up over a long period of time. You might collect two voucher specimens when you're out in the field. So you can keep one locally and you could send one to the state or territory herbarium. The voucher specimen should include all the plant parts that you need to distinguish one species from another. So that includes flowers, fruiting structures and vegetative material. Not what my colleagues call an eco scrap. So a very tiny piece, a single flower or a single leaf, because it's very hard to get um, uh, verify identity from that eco scrap. Sometimes you can collect the whole plant if you've got a grass or an orchid, but do be really careful if you're going to do that and get advice if you're collecting where there are very few individuals present, because it's really important during collecting that we don't damage those field populations. Because the information um, about a specimen is often recorded in a centralised database, it makes sense that the identifier for that collection, maybe the collector number or the accession number, is the number that's used to link all the different records about the collection. And just a side note, if you're building up a picture of what a target species looks like, or you're creating a customised collection or identification manual for your local area, then voucher specimens can be a really important part of this. We also have some other guidelines um, that ANPC worked on last year called the Floribank Guidelines, and there are some great tips about building up that kind of customised collection manual in Module 6, and I'll share the link to that uh, when I talk about resources later. Uh, photographs are important recognition records in their own right, but they don't replace a voucher specimen. The information that's collected in the field usually follows a standardised format, so it can be shared with other users inside and outside your organisation. And you can see here an example field data sheet from the germplasm guidelines. So we have the date, the collector names and numbers, location details and coordinates, the number of plants sampled, and an estimate of the population size, information about phenology, so whether the plants are flowering, fruiting or dispersing seed, and also population health, including presence of obvious disease or grazing. Now, this information can be extremely useful to a whole range of end users because you might be the only person documenting details about the species or the population for five or 10 years or even more. So it can be really useful for assessing conservation status and how a plant population is changing over time. Um, so now I've got over a few tips for record keeping relating to different types of germplasm, starting with seed. It's really important to keep track of each seed collection during processing, cleaning, 
storage and testing. So you maintain its value and its genetic integrity. You really don't want to mix up or confuse two batches of seed at any stage of handling. So one tip is to keep multiple labels within the seed batch. So you can have one in the bag and the other on the bench or the cleaning equipment or the tray. Um, and these uh, multiple labels can stay with the collection throughout. And you can see an example of how we've used this for a Pomodera seed collection at the Australian Plant Bank. Ex situ collections might even mean keeping maternal lines separate, so seeds from individual plants are stored separately. This is obviously very labour intense, but it can be really important for some conservation collections, and we have some details about that in the germplasm guidelines. When you're testing seeds, the accession number or the collector number is probably the main identifier linking the seeds back to their matching field data. But technology, um, including barcodes and QR codes, can make this quicker. And there's more details about processing and testing seed collections in Chapter 5 of the Germplasm Guidelines. Now, we have a whole chapter about managing nursery collections in this new edition of the Germplasm Guidelines. And several BEGANS members helped write or review this information including Cathy Offord, Ewan Mills, Julie Percival, Amanda Shade, Shane Turner, Mark Weiler and Warren Walkways. So there are lots of excellent tips in Chapter 8. Maintaining the identity of each collection in the nursery is so important. And as we know, the labels and records need to be maintained over long periods of time. So it's important that they're long lasting, UV and weatherproof, as they travel through the process of propagation, to planting out, maybe during maintenance such as repotting and even off-site for translocation or sharing of meta collections. Unlike museum collections that might be listed in a database, nursery collections multiply over time. So you've got multiple generations of the same accession to track. And this also means that the records that you create can be used by new staff or volunteers years after a collection is established and you've moved on. So it needs to include as much information as possible and be easy for someone to understand, even if they're not familiar with the species or the project. And you might need different labels for different purposes and different timeframes. And you can see we've got different labels on the same Wollamai pine plant in the image here. Um, and you might back up your plant labels with a digital map or a paper map in each setting where you have your plants. Now, I'm really lucky. My colleague at the Australian Botanic Garden, Mount Annan, Maureen Phelan, she looks after our Wollamai um, Pine ex situ collections and has shared some information about how the collections are labelled. And you can see the image at the left and the middle are the old and new accession tags. They've got the same information on them. They're just um, made of different materials. But I'll talk about those first. The accession number begins with the year that the plant material came into the collection. So 2003, and in the sequence of collections that year, it was 0492. The specific methodology used for the Wallamai collection was to use the same accession number for each collection trip and then use a suffix at the end of that, AA, AB, AC, to record the individuals. So tree one, tree two, tree three, collected from the wild population site. The accession number prefix at the beginning identifies the occasion of propagation. So AA is the first propagation for the original accession. AB is the second propagation. So that's really useful to get a snapshot of how many generations have been created since the first material was collected. And looking back historically, it also quickly shows if certain clones have been easy or difficult to propagate. So when Maureen started working on this collection, she could immediately see that both site one, tree 11 and 19 must have been easy to propagate because their prefixes were starting with a B. And she could also identify which individuals had never been propagated since the original collection or were really difficult because there were no existing prefixes or maybe only AA. So the prefix helped determine priorities for collection management by straight away indicating when numbers needed to be bolstered. And the tags for the plants also include the date of propagation. So as you can imagine, that's really handy data um, about tree age when you're standing in front of a specimen. 
Now, the other label here is a thin aluminium tag. That's a second unique identifier system. So that's been in place since the beginning and is carried on by all staff who've managed the collection historically through to today. Um, and the tags have a letter um, for each of the four sites and then a number that's for each new plant that enters the collection, either from propagation or new collection trips. So we, they can see exactly how many plants that there are for every individual from every site since the beginning of this really special collection. And that identifier is also recorded in an Excel spreadsheet that's passed from staff member to staff member. And that spreadsheet records a lot of information and is also a really good way to see where each individual tree ends up. It could be at another botanic garden in Australia or overseas, could be donated to a community greening site, to a university for research, or to a translocation site. Now, just quickly, the germplasm guidelines also include details on managing collections in tissue culture and in cryopreservation, and that has its own unique record keeping challenges. So the tissue culture collections need to list the date that the material entered culture, uh, the subculturing details, um, treatments and the media used. The cryopreservation is used to store collections for very long periods of time under liquid nitrogen. So the vials and the labels have to be robust to storage at extremely low temperatures. But it's important that the details are recorded in a way that you know where each vial is and what's stored because you can't actually make quick checks or you risk damaging the germplasm. So you can read more about these collection types and how to maintain records for them in chapters 9 and 10. So just to recap, it's important to recognise that the conservation collections have three components the plant material or germplasm, a voucher specimen and the collection data. So it's particularly important in conservation that we share and build upon our knowledge of unique plant species. So this can take the form of a template such as one in the Atlas of Living Australia or in a botanic gardens database such as Hortus. You can also share information by writing about your experience with a particular species or collection in um, a journal like the Botanic Gardener or Australasian Plant Conservation or another journal or newsletter. And you can find more information about managing, about the data systems used to manage ex situ collections in chapter 15. Image management is also covered in that same chapter and both general images and scientific images can be really informative and provide great reference material for conservation collections. Um, and the Seeds of South Australia database is well worth a look. It has a range of seed images for Australian native species. So um, these are some of the resources I mentioned today and we'll share them in the chat. Um, and we are also happy to put the slides on the ANPC website if you'd like to access them later as well. And a big thank you to the Ian Potter Foundation for funding the Germplasm Guidelines Revision and these Plant Treasures webinars. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks so much. That's wonderful. Um, we have time for one question if anyone has one specific one for Amelia. Um, I can't see you all see, uh, pop it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, there's lots of content there and lots of things to follow up with, no doubt. So um, perhaps through the rest of the speakers, you can kind of mull over some of those things that Amelia's talked about um, and we can have a discussion. Um, I don't see any questions, so we'll carry on. So our next speaker, um, I'll hand over to Damien. Amelia's going to be doing the slides. Damien's going to be doing the presenting, so over to you both. Thanks, Emma. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Can everyone hear me OK? Yep. Great. Um, yeah, thanks to Amelia for doing the slides. I'm having some major issues, so hopefully it doesn't drop out on you. Great. Um, so, yep, yeah, I'm Damien Wrigley, the National Coordinator for the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. And I'm just going to talk to you today, um, step beyond um, what Amelia spoke about. So where can your data go? What can you do with it once you've collected it and managed it? Next slide, please. No time for a drink, Amelia. <laughs> it's all good. Awesome. 
So just quickly about the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. So it's an alliance of seed banks, botanic gardens and flora focused organisations around Australia. Um, we were set up by the Council of Heads of Australian Botanic Gardens, which is Australia's peak body for botanic gardens. So they're there really to represent our community to, um, you know, policy and government and try and influence that um, that element of working with um, government and botanic gardens around Australia. They also helped to set up Begans initially. Um, because the Council of Heads of Australian Botanic Gardens institutions around the country have seed banks in their um, major capital city botanic garden facilities, um, they felt that seed banking was the area that they should focus on. Um, and so that's their major project that they do. Next slide, please, Amelia. So this is just a, a quick indication of where we have seed banks around the country. Um, the lines don't show you where they're located. It's just an indication of the state. But there are partners that have the major seed banks. They're in each of those capital cities, uh, with some states having more than one. They have two. Um, and then we also work with Millennium Seed Bank in the UK. So they've really supported us to get to where we are today. Um, in 20 years ago, um, the Australian seed banking sector was really only just starting out. Um, like where a lot of you are right now. Um, it's taken this long to get to where we are with a lot of advocacy, a lot of support from the Millennium Seed Bank and from governments around Australia and business supporting us to do our projects. Thanks, Amelia. So what we, um, we've, the, the, the position that we've got to now is we've got these disparate data sets across all of the states and territories. We've got different institutions that have different governance arrangements based on being either local, state or uh, territory or federal institutions. So they've got different governance rules around them. They've got different procurement rules. They've got different facilities. So a lot of the same issues that a lot of you face and you know the kind of things that influence you to get to where you've got to with Begans looking at something like hoarders. So for us, trying to get our data consolidated and easily accessible for um, funders like the Millennium Seed Bank, um, the partnership moved to using the Atlas of Living Australia. So that helped us to overcome some of those vari variations in the way that data is collected based on some of the influences like state territory legislation. So some of the ways that you treat different species. Um, but generally, most of those things that um, Amelia pointed out are pretty consistent across the partners. So by bringing it together, we've been able to um, organise a meta collection. It shows that what we've got across the country is more than the sum of its parts. Um, it really helps us with, you know, the institutional justifications for what we're doing, um, some of the project reporting that we do, but also it helps us if we've got any uh, joint projects for research um, and then also responding to things like the bushfires, those kind of threats that are national in nature. So biosecurity, being able to work together and understand who's working on what with metal rust, um, some of the issues with climate change, um, but it also helps us by consolidating our data. We can tell a better story and a richer story, a better narrative around what we're doing, what we're achieving, and it helps to encouraging um, funding from governments and philanthropy. Next slide, please. So just some of the basic things, you know, when we use our data, um, obviously, like Amelia said, we're going to be using it for managing in seed banks. Um, it helps us when we're managing those collections when they extend out to the nursery and the botanic gardens. It also helps us with things like restoration and translocation projects that we're doing. Um, so that can be whether it's being done by students, whether it's being done by, a, um, you know, projects by government, whether it's with business, if there's development opportunities that they're looking at. Um, but really, the sorts of things that we're seeing the use with our collections is those extended specimen concepts, you know, right the way through from following those kind of protocols that Amelia was talking about, making sure that you've got the right um, herbarium specimens and um, not, what did you call it, Amelia, those eco samples, um, something like that, you know, making sure that you've got proper documented um, collections the whole way through means that they can be used in seed banks, they can be used in garden displays, they can go on to be used in DNA research, in digital collections, and so many other applications down the track, even once you've moved on, those can still hold value and still tell a rich story. Next slide, please. So just uh, moving on to the Australian Seed Bank Online again. Um, so basically this aggregates the data from all of our partners. So across the entire um, collection that we've got in there to date, there's about 45,000 collections in that online aggregated data set. So it's all based on Darwin Core to help maintain some consistency with the data. And it can be searched in a number of ways, depending on what it is you're looking for and how you want to um, allocate you know, the, your time looking for things. So I've just done a very simple search there. All I've done was put in plant bank. And then what you can see there, those orange dots are all the collections that have been submitted to the ALA by um, plant bank in New South Wales. So you can see they've been very busy across every state and territory and out into some of those island territories as well. So it's a really fascinating way um, for us to get a visual representation of what's going on 
um, with ghost collections, where are we focusing most of our effort? And you will tend to see, um, you know, with some of the smaller institutions in particular, there'll be a strong focus on their jurisdiction. Obviously, some larger institutions like Plant Bank or the Australian National Botanic Gardens that have maybe a broader remit will be going out across broader areas. There's also functions on there that can bring out graphs and charts, looking at the kinds of things, um, cutting it based on families, um, based on collection size, a range of different things. So please feel free to go in there and have a play with that. Um, make sure you've got plenty of bandwidth. It can take some time. But all of those data sets are linked to different data sets across the ALA platform. So things that are held in herbariums, any other data that is in there um, that has relevance to those species and to those collections can be linked across um, just to provide a richer experience for what you're looking at. Um, it's worth mentioning that it is about 10 years old now, so it's starting to show its age. It's looking a little bit weary, and there are some functionality um, uh, wish list things that we would like in there um, that basically means that we can provide a richer story. So at the moment, predominantly it's seed collections. What we really want to get in there is the germination protocols as well, so that uh, people can use those collections to not just understand where they are, but understanding how to use those collections. So particularly if you're working with something that might be very difficult to collect, might only set a small amount of seed, um, you know, you don't want to be wasting your time recreating germination protocols that somebody has already created. So getting those in there, making that information available is really critical to make sure that people aren't, one, wasting seed if they've only got a little bit, but also wasting time when someone else has already done the work. Um, until that update um, is finished, so we're just negotiating that at the moment with the ALA, um, hoping to have that in, uh, completed by the end of this year um, and to have those germination protocols in there. But until that time, there are some, um, some of our partners like uh, James in Tasmania and the South Australian um, Seed Centre, they've got those germination protocols online, even at just a, a, an initial data set to help you understand what you could do and who to go to to talk to. Next slide, please. Actually, what I should just say, even though we're moving on, um, is what we're hoping is that the ALA can accept some of those seed collections um, data from other institutions as we go forward. So um, as we get to a point where we can hopefully um, ingest that kind of information, we'll let people know as well. So that would hopefully complement the kind of work that you're doing through Hoarders with the rest of your collections management too. Um, so stepping up to that sort of national level, trying to understand where we could use these kind of collections, why an update to the ALA is so important. Um, it means that we can just have something that anybody can access about that national meta collection. So illustrating the importance of what we've got um, nationally um, really helps us to understand where our priorities could be. So um, being able to also benchmark what you're doing. So how are you how are you going against other facilities around the country? You know, do you have a similar level of flora in your jurisdiction or your region that you're working on? Uh, have you got as much represented in your collections? Do you have um, just single collections? Do you have duplicate collections? Have you got um, you know several populations represented in your collections? Are you capturing that genetic diversity? Um, and it also means that we can use this kind of information to do the research and do the other projects, the translocations, the restoration work. That means that we can share that information and become a bit of an international and regional leader and have uh, meetings like this Australasian Seed Science Conference where we can share what we're learning about our collections and share what we're learning about our flora. One of the things we're also looking to do this year is um, we're doing a review of the entire collection. So there is data that we hold in seed banks that hasn't yet made it onto the Atlas and Living Australia. And hopefully by going through the process of re reviewing these, um, we can complement the information that's in the ALA and we can use that to try and prioritise future um, seed collecting activities. Next slide, please. So just another um, example of how we can pull our data together. So as, as um, facilities mature with their data collection, as they mature with their programs, we're starting to see um, facilities are increasing the um, complexity of the work that they're doing. So each every couple of years, we perform an audit of our seed facilities in the Australian Seed Bank Partnership. And um, that helps us to understand the kinds of equipment, the kinds of expertise they've got. Um, and we were able to use this information in the germplasm guidelines um, to provide a visual representation of those um, facilities and the kind of expertise they have. There's a few extra facilities in this map that aren't part of the partnership, so Forestry Product Commission sort of facilities, but it's really important that we capture that too. So hopefully when we go to do a germplasm guidelines for, and hopefully saying that doesn't give Amelia a heart attack, but hopefully when we get to that point of doing that, we'll have a few more images on here to show some more facilities around the country and we're seeing that grow and the expertise increase. Next slide, please. 
So um, just lastly, this is um, another example of where the information can go and what it can do. So the Threatened Species Commissioner um, under their last um, Threatened Species Strategy had to report on progress. One of the targets in that was 100% um, of plants in conservation seed banks, um, a fairly impossible task to do given how complicated many of our species are, but that's the target we had and we contributed information for that. So the Australian Seed Bank Partnership used our data sets to inform how many EPPC listed species, for instance, are in um, seed banking facilities um, in, across the partnership. Um, and that's really helped us to push that narrative about what it is we're doing, how much there is still to go. Um, and it's helped us to justify asks for funding from philanthropy and from government. So using our information in this way is actually been really beneficial for us to try and get that support. Um, other areas that we've used it is um, supporting the Australian government to report on the international obligations for things like forest genetic resources um, and also the global strategy for plant conservation under the CBD. So for many of you, you'll be familiar with that through the work that BGCI and BGANS do in supporting the global strategy for plant conservation. And it's been really critical for us in the partnership using that as something to work towards in the past decades. And we'll do so again when the next set of targets are um, agreed by the, the CBD, hopefully this year. Um, and I think just the last one I mentioned before, but it's really important for us is just that um, prioritisation of the work we do. Understanding collectively what we have means that we can be a bit more strategic with the resources we have. While we've been really successful getting money, when you split the kind of money we've been getting across the many partners that we have, it doesn't end up being a huge amount of money. So you've got to be smart about the way you use it. And so being able to talk to each other, being able to understand what we're all doing means that we can make better decisions about how we prioritise that funding um, and how we prioritise the limited time we also have as well. Um, so that's a very quick snapshot. Um, obviously, I could keep talking all day about the work that we do. Um, if you wanted to get in touch, please um, feel free to reach out to me. And a big thanks to the Importer Foundation, um, Begans and AMPC for letting me present on this today. Thanks, Amelia. Wonderful. Thanks, Damien. Um, so if you have any questions for Damien, um, just raise your hand. Um, otherwise, we will carry on. Um, certainly from a New Zealand perspective, it, um, we don't have this kind of coordination of seed banks yet. So it's something that um, certainly I aspire to being involved with at some stage. Um, so the next presenter is myself. So I'm just going to do a bit of a tag team, so Havad, this is your like two minute warning, um, <laughs> that I am going to do a quick kind of overview of some of the things that you as BGANS members uh, have access to in terms of tools and resources to support some of this um, work. That and then I'll just um, hand over to Havad to give us a little update on Cordis and then um, I will uh, kind of wrap up and give you a, an example of something that I've been working on in terms of ex situ uh, conservation and how records work with that to kind of get the um, Q&A portion of the workshop um, started. So as uh, uh, BGANS members, we've got lots of different kind of channels that we can really utilise to uh, benefit our members and one of those is through these types of forums where you can kind of connect with others see what other people are doing um, we have a specific bcar mailing list which is really underutilized but it is a way we we can share um, stories and messages um, but also tap into that knowledge if you're not sure who to speak to on a topic or you kind of want to canvas a group of people to see what technologies is working for them um, an example is John Arnott recently asked what people were using in terms of tag machines. Um, I went to America once to kind of look at that type of work, but it's much easier these days to do that uh, through through email and these online forums. Um, we also have the Botanic Gardener, which I really recommend um, more of you contributing unique articles, especially about what you're doing in your living collections. It's such a fantastic way to see what you're doing, but see what your uh, challenges are and how you've overcome those because a lot of us are just having the same challenges just in a different location. Um, and we also have um, as become we have gone through that process of finding a database that would um, allow many of our members to become more proficient at records and get you kind of into into records management. So um, I'm going to hand over to Havad. Um, to talk to us a little bit about 
what's happening with Hortus, um, if you haven't been keeping up to date with that. Um, so over to you, Havard. Thank you very much, Emma. And uh, yeah, great to see you all. Uh, we, we really find this group fantastic because uh, yeah, there, there are not that many that uh, of such a big audience of plant records enthusiasts. So that's really great at the work you do. And um, now I just want to quickly say, uh, for those of you who haven't uh, followed Hortis or have looked at Hortis, uh, we're now really start to pick up pace in terms of adding features. So the only thing I wanted to say is two things. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to our blog, uh, because now we're starting, we published uh, yesterday uh, the the latest release notes. So now we're going to start sharing updates on, on the monthly basis about our progress. So for those of you who are quite advanced in plant records, uh, you might think that Hortis is a bit basic for us. And it is at this point, but uh, we're, we're going to really work hard to, to uh, facilitate all these things that we discussed today uh, as well. Uh, going forward down the line. So, so just keep keep up to date with that. And if you're interested and uncertain about if Hortis is uh, good at, or fit your needs, get in touch. That's uh, probably it. Uh, we are hoping to get people uh, access to trials of Hortis so you can try it out and, and have a look uh, at is it second quarter. So, so, so this is not available yet for everybody. And we have about 10 gardens now already on Hortis. And, and that pace is going to go up uh, through the, uh, I'm just going to say the spring, but of course it's the autumn here. But <laughs> so anyway, that's all from us, but, but get in touch. That's what we want to say and uh, subscribe if you want to keep it up to date. Thank you. Thanks, Havard. Um, I also like to mention that um, with uh, being part of Hortus, there is kind of a begins only forum part of their website. So it is a, also another channel where you can connect with each other um, as users of the same technology. I find it's really useful to be able to email people, contact people who are using the same program as you and bounce ideas off each other. So um, that's another channel where we can share ideas. So, um, I will just kind of finish before we crack into some Q and A's because I know that you've got lots of things, uh, ideas and questions for us. But um, let me just make my screen bigger. Um, so this is just an, a little example of a New Zealand plant called Metrosiris bartlettii or Bartlett's rata. It's uh, related to our uh, New Zealand Christmas tree, the Putakawa, and it is a highly threatened species, grows in the very far north of New Zealand and uh, there are only 12 individuals left in the wild. Um, in the germplasm guidelines is a, is a little bit of a case study on the species in terms of how we have uh, managed it in terms of myrtle rust. So if you want to know a little bit more about that side of things, check out the guidelines. Um, but in terms of records, this is a really uh, unique one that we can't access these plants from the ground and so we have to access them from helicopter and uh, that can create challenges in terms of collecting records when you're hanging off uh, the bottom of a helicopter and what we found was when we had cuttings sent to us um, a lot of the numbers didn't necessarily line up with those that we were given in terms of uh, GPS locations didn't tie to the right trees etc so one of the things that uh, I would caution is before that uh, data is given over to the provider or whatever um, nursery or, or garden might be growing on your materials to do a bit of a, a cross reference, a, do a bit of a double check. Even though um, some of these things are super uh, time sensitive, you need to get into a nursery really quickly. Um, you do need to do a little bit of due diligence around checking that your numbers line up. Sometimes it's a little bit of a headache, especially when I received this, it was, it was a handover from a predecessor. So you don't always have the opportunity to check back with someone. Was that bag seven or bag 17? Um, and when they head into the nursery, as Amelia mentioned, we do um, lots of different types of tags. We, we do sometimes do some handwritten tags, which are, um, are always backed up with something printed and something metal. So that longevity. Um, and then when they're potted up from the kind of tray cutting stage, then every individual plant starts to get um, a, a sticker on their pot and a metal tag in the pot or attached to, to the tree with wire. Um, we keep very minimal information on those labels. We do keep the accession number, uh, we keep the name, and 
for this particular project, we did also keep um, the identifier that the uh, conservationists that collected it from the wild on those labels as well. Um, that is, in a New Zealand context, um, something we uh, follow through is something called Whakapapa, which is kind of looking at the family history and it is really just looking at that maternal line and so that those unique identifiers that they were given uh, traces back to very specific individuals in specific locations. And when they were finally planted out, then they got uh, GPS locations for each individual plant. Um, I like to think of the things that you do now are for the future. Um, the records that you collect have to tell a story and they have to tell it well enough that you can't tell the story. It has to be told through the information that you leave behind. So um, it's good to do a very thorough job um, and sometimes just get someone to check that it, it makes sense while you're doing it. Um, you never know what, what your um, future staff might be thinking at the time when they receive these types of projects. Um, so, um, I'm going to leave it there and see, do we have any questions from the audience about all things exitue conservation and records? Just uh, put your hand up. I should be able to see you if you uh, use the little hands up icon. Amelia? Yeah, thanks, Emma. So um, I have a question from Joel, who's, um, who's managing plant records um, at the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney. So um, do you have some examples where you didn't know how valuable the records were until later on, until something happened and you're like, thank goodness we have all of that? I'm sure other people online will have those stories as well. I think Joel might just be figuring out turning his um, microphone. No, he's having connection issues. Uh, Does anyone, and it might be someone else online has a similar story. They've been collecting records and then um, it becomes, yeah, really obvious just how important they are. I don't know whether Zoe is answering or, um, or asking another question. Hello, it's Zoe at the Botanic Gardens in Canberra. How are you? I'm not sure if you can actually see me because I think my camera is a bit broken on my monitor. Sorry, that's a real missed opportunity. But uh, so I'm the conservation manager here at the Botanic Gardens as of the last few months. And we have some species growing here in our nursery. And one of the things that we've found, well, that I've found so fascinating is um, we have partnerships with CSIRO and when we have genetic research undertaken, we have discovered that we have some unique genotypes here for some particular species. And so there's one that we're working on at the moment. There's only probably five plants left in the wild and they're dioecious. And so all the ones in the wild are male. And it turns out we have the only female plants left in the world growing in the nursery. So um, we've actually managed to achieve fruit production and seed production this year, which is the first time that's been seen in the wild ever. Um, so yes, it's really incredible. And the value of that collection for us now is because we've been able to maintain those ex separate accession records so we can track all the genetic lineages. And we're now using that um, genetic research to inform how we manage the collection. So where we've got, you know, 50 of the same what appears to be the same genotype, we can now reduce those and combine them under one accession number, um, but maintain the other ones as separate lineages. Awesome, that's a really good example. Joel? Yeah, hi, sorry, not, what, not sure what happened there. I tried to unmute and then uh, lost everyone there, but uh, yeah, we regularly have examples of things that um, you know, we're, we're collected either as a side thing or, or perhaps um, the main purpose of a collecting trip and and weren't really uh, realised to be significant at the time. Uh, one example is is a Banksia specimen that I collected from Blackheath. Uh, didn't particularly look different morphologically, but um, it was for a project where it, it got genotyped. And it now looks to be uh, possibly a, a new species as well. So 
Um, it's genetically isolated from all the other Banksias that that uh, that, that team has looked at, and uh, even though it doesn't look particularly different, the data strongly suggests that, that it's a new species or an unidentified species. So um, at the time of collection, you know, we, we had no idea. It really didn't look distinct. So it's only because, uh, you know, we managed to get all the relevant details and can now get back to it and monitor it and, and p potentially collect more samples and, and uh, survey the population that that, um, that those records have, have really stood out as particularly interesting. But you just don't know when you're collecting something uh, what the significance is. And it may not be relevant for a very, very long period of time. So it's just essential to make sure you, you absolutely capture as much detail as you can. And like Emma said, the the data has to be obvious and tell a story to the next person. So it's no good to just have institutional knowledge. You really have to have the data there to to allow you to communicate to, to whoever has your job in the future um, about exactly what happened and when and, and try to resolve anything interesting that, that may come up. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, I was going to ask as well, and I might follow up um, asking the same question to James Wood, who's online and does a lot of seed collecting. So when you're out in the field, what are some of the pitfalls when you're recording data? Uh, would you like me to answer first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, reception can be one, um, depending on your method of data capture. So if you're using something like a mobile phone app and, and there are lots of really good apps now which can allow you to collect data in the field then you got to make sure you you've got battery <laughs> and reception um, but obviously you can for most of them you can enter uh, enter the data from a gps which which is often more accurate anyway um, from a data management perspective uh, I, I think the thing to try and avoid as much as possible is um, having to read a number to another person and have them write it or transcribe it yourself. Um, if you can avoid that in the field, that's excellent. If you can avoid that again back in the office, that's even better because every time you, you copy a number, um, you're more likely to get it wrong. So, it, so if you can avoid that as much as possible and reduce that as much as possible, then, then that's really good. Um, neat handwriting is certainly a plus if you're if you're you're writing things out. Um, there's a lot of pitfalls like that. Um, I guess pens. We, you know, if you're writing something down in pencil and it happens to get wet, it won't run. Unlike pens. So if you've got a, a the ability to use pencil or an archival pen, uh, that's that's certainly a good option as well. Although archival pens are really expensive compared to pencils, so definitely take pencils in my case when I was doing field work. But um, yeah, there's a lot of things like that that um, may not be obvious to, to someone doing their first collection trips, but um, I'd always encourage them to try and get in touch with someone else who's regularly doing field work and get some advice about different ways to record data and what to record and, and how. That's great. I don't know if James Wood's online, if if he wants to chip in there as well. He's also um, supervises a lot of um, volunteers doing germination testing in the lab. So I imagine there's plenty to explain about um, making good records there. Thanks, James. Hi. Uh, so in terms of, uh, I mean, in, in, with regards to your question, which was the um, errors in the field, um, yeah, like I don't know if I've got anything more to contribute to what Joel said. You know, I'm I'm very low tech. I take paper records. Uh, I have a GPS device with me when I'm working, and I have that on all day. So whenever I'm making a taking a record, I'm just actually adding a waypoint to the day, uh, to the um to the GPS, putting in my collector's number, so that uh, even if I write things back. Uh, down wrongly in terms of position, I can check back and I can always go. So very occasionally, I'm like, all of this stuff is just stored on, on you know, I sync the, the GPS with the um, Garmin software on the computer. So even now, I've actually gone back to records um, 
like seven years ago. So actually just recently I found some records being copied over. So material being sent to Canberra, that material being added to the ALA, that material had then been sent to the Natural Values Act in Tasmania. And somewhere along the way, the actual uh, location um, grid references have been corrupted. So um, I then went back to my records, go for, well, have I got it wrong or has Canberra got this wrong? And so I said, I have to go back and open my old uh, Garmin software, uh, the database on the computer, and just look it up and find that no, I was actually, I was correct. Some of the online numbers have been corrupted. So, yeah, having a backup system, you know, paper's pretty good, but um, yeah, having the, um, the um, records from, from the GPS just to confirm where you were on that day can be very useful. It's a good backup. Um, in terms of data, field data for germination testing, that, that's a, a, a bit more tricky for me that the, the big significant thing there is actual date times. When did you harvest this stuff? You know, um, now the mental narrative I go through when trying to deal with germination data is, is basically, um, you know, what happened between when you calculated something and when you think natural recruitment is likely to take place. Now, obviously, sometimes we just don't know this. You know, none of this stuff is documented anywhere. Uh, but at least you have a starting point in terms of, okay, well, this habitat, when is likely to be likely to be established and um, okay, when do we collect it and what's like what's likely to happen between those two events. So, you know, that can be pretty useful. Thanks, James. Um, Wahi, did you have something to add? Uh, uh, yeah, I did actually, yeah, related to that. Um... Hello, yeah, everyone. I'm Mohid from Botanical Software and the Hortus team. Um, but yeah, related to that, and perhaps a question for Damien. So, as someone who sort of formally worked at the um, at the Millennium Seed Bank partnership, I found it, you know, really exciting to hear how uh, some of the work that that the Australian Seed Bank partnership is doing and achieving across the region. But um, one question I had was that the the Millennium Seed Bank at Q only developed its sort of conservation standards, I think it was back in 2015. So it was relatively uh, recently. And I, my question was um, related to the standards that are being developed sort of across Australia and, and, and how well established are those? I know you mentioned Darwin Core, um, but do you have any challenges in, in you know, standardising the data that, that's recorded at each of these institutions and, and how are you sort of overcoming that? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I think, it, you know, 20 years on from the uh, the start of um, collecting as a sort of a collective, obviously there was collecting going on pre-2000. Um, I think it really just, the, I guess the federated nation, uh, nature of Australia makes it interesting. We've got, you know, different systems in place, um, which means we're um, collecting for different systems across um, the different institutions. So while we can have standards and we can have um, protocols, um, you know, we're on the third edition of the germplasm guidelines, um, and I and you know, similar with the flora bank guidelines, you've got these things that are there to help us try and have some consistency and try and um, you know make things more compatible. Um, it just comes down to um, how complex our systems are across an entire country. Um, you know, we have people procuring databases at different times. We have them procuring them from different organisations and for different purposes. You know, for some um, organisations, it might just be to manage their living collection. For others, it might be to do their living collection and their seed banks. Um, so it really depends that there's, there's just so many different ways of cutting the cake. And I think that's why for us, um, having something like the um, Australian Seed Bank Online was one way of trying to um, consolidate the information in a way that you know is comparable, um, which I'm you know similar sort of thing as what began is trying to do with hoarders, trying to make things as as simple and as comparable as possible. Um, but it really does then come down to you know what you're using the data for, um, what's the intended purpose, um, and I think that's the kind of questions you need to ask yourself before you start collecting. Um, Zoe, you had your hand up for a little while. Sorry, I think I just forgot to put it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Damien, don't go away. Um, hopefully, 
I'm not sure if you can still hear me, Damien. Yeah. Um, uh, question from John. Do we currently approach capturing genetic and provenance data across meta collections akin to zoo style stud book database? Uh, so that's something that we, um, it's different across the partnership. Some partners have started collecting that information and it really depends on the um, the funding that they've got available um, to do that work. So we've got a project at the moment, um, a bushfires one, um, going across the five states that were most heavily impacted on the east coast and the south. And we're collecting um, species across um, New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Um, just to do that genetic analysis and just see the difference in the populations. And so those collections are all going to Victoria to be looked at. Um, but as far as capturing the data goes in a consolidated way, it's not something that we have on um, the list for this update to the ALA, but hopefully in the future, this is you know one of those add-ons that we can build into the system. So as we update it this time around, we're um, looking at ways to make sure it's as flexible as possible for those kind of things to be included as they become more um, and more common in the data collection that people are doing. Mm. Great answer. And maybe, I don't know, Havad, if you want to comment on that, because it's also something that certainly I know people look at when they think about a database of what they want. They sometimes look at a zoo system and think, oh, that's quite good. Is there a version for living collections? Is that something that Hortus is kind of thinking about as well as how that integrates in your system? Yeah, I think uh, in, in general, uh, our, our sort of, we ha we're sort of struggling as, as all these kind of systems do in terms of scoping, but we definitely want to uh, offer a, a service that, that satisfy the whole industry. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we will do is to, uh, as a platform, because it's a service oriented architecture, we will also focus a lot on offering integration opportunities. So uh, that means uh, integrating with the, especially this, the, there's more unique uh, use cases like, uh, uh, I'd say, um, maybe that there are some seedback activities that are more appropriately developed by another product that we then will integrate with. So, so, so this is, uh, you know, for the future in terms of how this will evolve, but uh, at the end of the day, I think we, we, as a platform, we want to offer a tool that fits the industry as a whole, not just individual or small gardens or specific gardens, but then do that through more of an organic platform than, than a, a sort of a, a huge product that does all kinds of things. So that's our strategy at least. And, and uh, hopefully you see some of that. Uh, all over this so, yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> was that an animal? <laughs> Sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> oh, it's a dog, yeah. yeah. I, I was hoping it was a, a sort of like a native bird or something anyway, but a native dog. Correct, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm trying to do it. <laughs> Um, that was a good response. Um, so I'm aware that we're coming to the end of the session. So if you have any last minute burning questions, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank everyone, all the speakers, Amelia, Damien, um, Joel and James for being in the background, Wahid and Havad for um, joining in the wee hours of the morning. Um, I really appreciate the conversation that's happened and I hope it's been of benefit to um, many of you attending. Our next session in March will be very exciting as well. This will be kind of focused around biosecurity and the conservation context. So uh, stay tuned when we send out the recording of this. For those who missed it, we will introduce uh, the speakers and that topic further. Um, so yeah, just thank you again to um, ANPC um, for joint sharing this session with uh, the GANs. So thank you all for coming. Thanks so much, Emma.